so on behalf of NYU Shanghai, um, NYU Shanghai Humanities, the writing program, we create a writing minor. Um, my name is David Perry, by the way, senior lecturer and the coordinator of creative writing here. I welcome you um, and welcome our guests, Eugene Ossoshevsky and Hanbo, who will be reading their poetry tonight. Um, and afterwards, we'll have an opportunity for some discussion. So, uh, Eugene will be reading first. I'll introduce him. And then uh, Hanbo, after that, I will say a few words about Eugene, who um, I've known, I don't know, it's probably 20 years uh, from back when I used to live in New York. And he was always very active in the downtown uh, poetry community there, um, in particular around the poetry project St. Mark's Church, uh, where a lot was happening in the 90s and continues to happen. Uh, also very active with uh, small press scene. And I came to know his work through some wonderful publications by the fantastic Brooklyn small press, I think Duffy Press. We have some um, little mini broadsides here. I don't know, Eugene, are these for? Yeah, but we only have a couple. Wait, okay, we only have a few, so maybe we'll uh, raffle them off or you know, we'll can arm wrestle. We'll figure out a way distribute them as fairly as possible. Um, and uh, it's a real thrill to have Eugene here as go-local faculty, uh, so he can also share his work with us. Uh, he's taught at NYU Liberal Studies since 2003, and uh, taught in Florence and Paris, uh, and currently lives in Berlin when he's not living in Shanghai. Um, he's the author most recently of a few of his titles up here. Um, uh, of the, uh, the Pirate Who Does Not Know the Value of Pi, a New York Review of Books, Poets Publication. And as you can see, he's a translator and editor as well. Um, this is a recent translation of the work of the Russian poet Alexander Vedensky. And here, um, an anthology of Russian absurdism, um, co-edited with, oh, you have to help me. Uh, the, uh, no, the editor, the editor did myself. Oh, it's well, just there were other translators. Okay, okay. 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 so part yeah, of a wonderful, of teams, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so part of a wonderful community of um, translators bringing Russian poetry into English. Um, He's also the poet, uh, the, the author of the book of poetry, The Life and Opinions of D.J. Spinoza, a book of poetry on the shortcomings of natural and artificial languages, and of a number of other books um, in which words are made to feel uncomfortable. Um, as I noted, he's a, a translator of avant-garde and experimental poetry from Russian. Um, and here's what I was thinking of, the recent co-translator with Ainsley Morris of the F letter, New Feminist Russian Poetry. Um, as you'll see, his work is wonderfully inventive, playful, um, and if anything, um, just a real wonderful trip, right? Um, through language, sound, and reference, um, and intellectual history. I'll leave the rest to Eugene, however, and perhaps we can discuss some of his work with him after the reading. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, F letter is the last thing, but I'm I'm the one of I'm a co-editor. Uh, has a whole there's a whole bunch of translators. Um, okay, look, um, I'm gonna uh, uh, read not anything consistent, but a, just a selection um, from different books. And I'm gonna start with uh, a recent uh, piece um, that I wrote uh, at the request of a friend of mine, Shiro Kati, who's a composer. Uh, Um, hold on, the slides are here. Just click on it. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Nice firm. Thank All right. Okay. If Ferrato is the muse of poetry, who is the muse of music? No muse is the muse of music. Any muse is the muse of music. A muse is she musing about her meaning with music. Take meaning away from musing and all that remains is music. It is the music that makes for feeling and not the meaning. Music is moving, but meaning merely amusing. We do not mean meaning, we mean the feeling of meaning. It is the feeling of moving and being moved. Therefore, we mean to mean meaning, but we mean music. Music names names. We assume it has meaning. It does not mean to. It means because it names, but it does not mean it. I feel my name being called in its omen, amen, and moan, you, yours. It may be the same omen, amen, and moan. The name is not the same. Is there a ruse in the music? How does it choose us? We are all hearing. We are hearing, hearing. We're not hearing. We are here. So um, and that poem is from a book I'm working on now, uh, which is a series of, uh, uh, it's called the Feeling Sonnets. And it's a series of 14 line poems. Uh, some of which are quite opaque, like this one, some of which are even more opaque, some of which are less opaque. And this is um, a poem from the Spinoza book. Um, called, uh, Now the Lord Said to DJ Spinoza. So um, uh, the DJ Spinoza book came out like 12 years ago, um, and it's poems, but there's a, there's a character in P.J. Spinoza, uh, uh, who is Spinoza the philosopher, but he's a DJ because DJs spin. Now the Lord <laughs> said to P.J. Spinoza, get out of your country. And D.J. Spinoza said to the Lord, what country are you talking about, Lord? Now the Lord said to DJ Spinoza, good start, good start, for I shall make you lost among nations. And DJ Spinoza said to the Lord, make me lost among nations, Lord, for I'm already lost among myself. Now the Lord said to DJ Spinoza, why do you bring up personal problems? Hire a therapist, you who made the schools ring with sick provo. And DJ Spinoza said to the Lord, Lord, is not the set of things in your apprehension infinite? Now the Lord said to DJ Spinoza, all things are one thing, but the irrationals are something else. Haven't you heard of the diagonal proof? And DJ Spinoza said to the Lord, so there's another God above you? Now the Lord said to DJ Spinoza, read my lips, get out of your country. And DJ Spinoza said to the Lord, but surely just the fact that you're talking in language means you admit of emotion. And the Lord said to DJ Spinoza, you want to be numbered on the tip of my boot? And DJ Spinoza made himself scarce. He lived among the deaf and became as one blind. He lived among the blind and became as one deaf. He saw never the sea. He awoke in a room with four walls. The room moved. He heard the voice of a child, but what it said he ignored. He awoke from awaking. He was aged, wrinkled, hairless, toothless. 
he remembered nothing of what had happened to him. Here's another piece from the same book. Um, um, so much of the book, you just Spinoza encounters different characters. One of them is God. One of them is the big Griffin. Griffin <clears throat> is a philosophical monster who's part Griffin. So, you know, lion, eagle, tiger, bear, monkey. Um, and part the Griff. The Griff is German for concept. Um, here he does not fight the Griff. And then he also has a friend named MC Squared. <laughs> Said DJ Spinoza to his friend MC Squared, let us go slay the Big Griffin. Frightful is the Big Griffin and sharp are his claws. He disobeys rules and cares nothing for laws. He's full of effects, but do they have a cause? Let us go slay the McGriffin, said MC Square to his friend DJ Spinoza. Why should we add to the misery of the world? Even the wicked have feelings. They shout and they quarrel because they're anal and oral. Problems make them immoral. They're wicked because they have feelings. And it stops. No, it's working. Just because, <laughs> what do you want to do then? You want to watch TV? No. You want to go play cards? No. You want to go get a beer? I'm sick of beer. It's so fattening. Let us go slay the McGriffin. Are you always so restless because you're reckless? Or are you so reckless because you're restless? Can't you even for a moment think of how it will make you feel in the morning? Tell me you won't be A, whining, B, wretched, C, moaning. And besides, even the wicked have feelings. So the two friends went off to slay the Griffin. But when they were halfway to the house of mostly unlike, DJ Spinoza realized he had forgot his sword at home and he can't slay the Griffin with no sword. They had to return for the sword, but by the time they did, it was already too late to do anything. They put slaying the Griffin off for tomorrow and went to sleep extremely content with themselves. Healing side of 17. Um, because I live in Germany, there's a lot of German that kind of enters the poems. So, uh, uh, so the word Tater here, it's also daughter and Tochter, right? Tot, Tochter is daughter in German. Tot in German is dead. Tot in Russian is that one over there. This is my totter. This is my other totter. They play at dress and redress. They are princesses. They wear prints. They wear prints out. Out of what? Out of line. Out to what? Out to tatters. They, hey, hey, do they speak? They speak a speak. They speak a speak of minds and takes. They speak a speak of eeks and keeps. They speak a speak of rates and tears. They speak a speak, I speak of not speaking. Hey, my totter totters across the room. My other totter totters across the room. My two totters totter across the room. They take a stance. They take a stance by happenstance. Tatter, I'm taught to you. I'm that other. Tatter, I'm taught to you. I'm that other. I'm that other to my tatters. And this is from yet another book, small chat book, um, which exists more in German translation than in English, although it's not mine in English. Um, and it's also quite old. Um, came out maybe a couple of years after Spinoza. And the character in there it's, uh, is Morris Imposternak, not the Boris Imposternak in Russian, but Imposter. And it's, um, it's a, he's a poet of unrequited love. When Morris Imposternak fell in love, the woman he loved didn't love him in return. And so he picked up a violin 
and said, you, violin, respond to my application because as an inanimate object, you have no choice. Play to me violin of the Amara we both know. You, because you're not alive. I, because I'm not loved. We're alike, you and I. We can't change the world. We can only make noise. The violin played. That is, its strings pushed the air to and fro. As Morris and Pasternak remembered how he made love to the woman who did not love him. Even as matters stood, the look of her eyes had made him forget himself. That is, forget was Morris and Pasternak. The violin played. Outside, buildings crowded together. And passers-by passed whose figures resembled figures such as the Russian L. All life is real life, the violin played. And the amaritude of Boris and Pasternak became set to music. Blessed are those who love. There are so few of them, almost everybody. Blessed are those who are loved. There are so few of them, almost everybody. How sad there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between these two sets. Uh, four, four, should be six. Um, it's six, I just... Uh, do not love. It is possible that nothing is true anyway, that we live in a forest of the griffins and that even we ourselves are the griffins. It is possible that I'm not saying what you think I am saying and that you're not hearing what you think you are hearing, but that we are scratching and howling on a branch in the dark to signify our loneliness and desire for mice and other delicious vermin. Do not love. For when you pop open a human being, all you find is 40 feet of intestine. And how lovable is that? Being a body is a liability and an indignity. It sags over time like a deflating balloon. If it toots your horn to embrace something that eats at one end and excretes at the other, why stop at people? Why not direct your emotions at cows? Do not love, for love will come to grief. And if it doesn't come to grief, it will come to grief anyway, since one of you must die first. What is the point of anything when everything has an end? The world is like the fiddling of a deaf musician in an empty room. He finishes, bows to whom, and modestly leaves. And then there's silence. How is the silence afterwards different from the silence during? It's really weird to read things that you wrote when you were much younger. <laughs> like, like you're you, but like you're also not you. Um, it's not like anything I could write now. In a universe renowned for its simplicity, composed as it was of P and not P, there lived a philosopher who became a painter. He painted portraits of philosophers. Each of them was caught in the act of thought, like a victim of eating disorder in front of the refrigerator. A river flowed past the painter's house with words in it that connected and disconnected very poetically. And sometimes you thought you understood what it said even though it was all random, and sometimes you didn't. The sun rose and the sun set, and sometimes the other way around, and the seasons progressed from winter to spring to summer to fall, and sometimes the other way around. Every Saturday, a philosopher who became a violinist came by to play always the same sonata composed of three movements. First movement, love. Second movement, love and loss. Third movement, 
just loss. The person this was dedicated to is now a tenured professor. This is so long. <laughs> um, okay, so this is from the pirate who doesn't know the value of pi. Um, and it's um, it's a book about the relationship between a pirate and a parrot, about how they sometimes, about the difficulties they have understanding one another uh, because they're different. So in some ways it's a book about marriage, but in other ways it's a book about immigration. <laughs> um, and there's a part in it where uh, they, take over a bunch of ships and that ship is called prize in the pirate <laughs> language. So they take over a bunch of prizes and then they start dancing and there's a whole bunch of like dance tunes. And this is one of them, uh, it's called pirate party music. Pice pirate. How many pirates does it take to calculate the value of pi? Pice pirate. I don't know, how about a party? East pirate. Yo, Ghana, what you got that smoking? Pie to the East pirate, eyes on the prize. Party with a pie parrot, pluckers, cannon, drums. Who's that Chewbacca doing headstands on the capstan? Who's hopping on the peg leg saying, you know, I don't have stain. Who's drumming up the rum, but white, it's the uncapped and the poop that's like a letter. It's got the stamp on. It's a pirate party. It's a pirate party. So shake your booty. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Shimmy with your scimitar on corals, some corals. You're all so handsome. You'll get a big ransom if it's all hands on deck. They'll raise an insane storm. Scratch blunder off your blunder bus. It's no blunder to blunder. The wheels on this bus are going rounder and rounder. Wave your bus in the air. It will get you anywhere. The passengers are panicking to pay their fare. Like Ralph Cramden and Ed Norton, you might come from Camden, but you'll get into the Norton. It's a pirate party, it's a pirate party, so shake your booty. It's a pirate party, it's a pirate party, leave duty in Djibouti. Somali pirates of the Caribbean got nothing on me, even when I'm peeing, I'm being ornery. I calculate the value of piasters like Mitt Romney, I climb the frigate rigging, bring the triggers on me, bullets are like boarding and that they don't bore me. I just spell boredom at board meeting saying hello, board members, care to walk the plank. I want to say thank you to your to you to you for your support of my disporting ashore with your offshore hoarding for bank rolling the rolling I do after porting for adding the ding to the fun I have cavorting. Your boarding school had your reporting on importing and exporting, but my boarding school was no frills. It's one major was boarding, and I got magna cum laude in the crowd of rowdies. I'm the rowdiest type here and disappear so fast the the quantum pirate. Yo, it's the max blank I walk because you know I'm so maximum. I eat up crystal plates placed next to a chrysanthemum. I'm full of stratagem. Parents think I'm a total jam and cockatoos skipping double dutch without slipping. Cool, I most likely to disrupt international shipping. <laughs> it's a pirate party. It's a pirate party. So shake your booty. It's a pirate party. It's a pirate party. We do the in Djibouti. It's a pirate party. It's a private party. Put on tutus, you're looting good. Um, and the last piece I'm going to read, whose title I misspelled, I was doing this on our, it should be PP Soros. Um, uh, it's also from the Spinoza book, but in fact, um, kind of the main refrain in it was invented by my nephew when he was about three or four years old. Uh, we were at the beach with him. Um, and he was at this age when boys are really interested in dinosaurs and peeping. And, and also, you know, that age when boys, girls, when they make up poems, right? When they kind of talk and talk rhythmically. And so I'm walking, so we're leaving the beach and I'm walking behind him. And I hear he's saying, peepee source, peepee source, go and make some peepee. So I was like, wow. <laughs> So I stole that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and this, so, yeah, so this is called Peter Soros. 27 philosophers 
study the eclipse. 27 philosophers are made up mostly of lips, 13 philosophers on each side, and the center one flips, says the center philosopher. You guys are upside down. The other philosophers say, no, it's you who's upside down. Pitisaurus comes in and says, the upside down is upside down. Have you heard about Pitisaurus? He buy a blue balloon. Green is the color of his orange hair. His smile is like a spoon. Yup, when the Pitisaurus comes, all the philosophers swoon, says the green philosopher to the orange philosopher. If N is O, then O is P and P is Q says the orange philosopher to the lilac philosopher, I follow you, says the lilac philosopher to the vermilion philosopher, what is the color of white, says the vermilion philosopher to the egg yolk yellow philosopher. Have you heard about the Pipisaurus? It's the end of the world. Everybody's expecting the Pipisaurus. Pipisaurus comes in and says, I'm not late, am I? No, says everybody. Pipisaurus, Pipisaurus, go and make some PP. Pipisaurus, Pipisaurus, go and make some pee pee, make some pee pee, Pipisaurus. Pee pee is yippee. Pipisaurus, Pipisaurus, what you're doing uptown? Pipisaurus, Pipisaurus, you're chasing our women around. Don't you worry, forget your Saurus. Pipisaurus is passing by. Yeah, Pipisaurus. Hey, Pipisaurus. Where did you get that hat? Hey, Pipisaurus, are you allergic to the cat? Hey, Pipisaurus, you dynamic dude. Today in a PP positive mood, you're looking later, was it? I mean, you're good. Oh, Pipisaurus, philosophers say, would you mind if we shouted hooray as you pass one way infinite like a ray? Clay sheep, clay cheek, clay shock, clay clay. Pipisaurus, yay, not, not Pipisaurus. Pipisaurus, what's your reply? Pipisaurus, he ain't to ply, no word can apply. Pipisaurus, no why, he's just, yeah, passing by. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I, I, I didn't note when we, uh, when I first introduced Eugene that I've also recently translated some um, Soviet era children's books yeah. into English. And um, I, I, I think that influence goes both ways in his telling. And I, I hope we have a chance to talk a little bit about that um, in the context of TV source <laughs> and uh, the, the pirate. And the parrot. Um, so this um, pairing of uh, Eugene Ostashevsky and Hangul is, is not purely by chance. Um, there is a pre-existing connection, and and I I also think um, there's a bit of a connection in terms of approaches to writing. Although Hangul's poetry, as you see, is quite different, there's also uh, a serious engagement through uh, wordplay, through what poetry can do with language to open up thought language uh, by way of surprising uh, intersections and juxtapositions that, that I hope we can think a little bit about moving forward. And it also turns out that um, Eugene knew of Hambo before coming by way of the translator Catherine Platt's uh, translations of some of uh, Hamlo's work, which he wrote while he was in Iowa, University of Iowa, um, at the International um, Writers um, Conference. I forget exactly. Uh, so we'll be hearing a little bit of Catherine Platt's translations tonight, as well as Hamlo's uh, poetry in Chinese. And um, I've also had the pleasure of. Uh, working on translations of his poetry as well. We'll read some of that. And there's a fantastic new translation of Hamburg's uh, work into Russian. We'll have the pleasure of hearing one of his poems read in the Chinese, in English translation, and also in Russian translation. Um, and perhaps it's a bit of a setup for what we might do if we have a, a 
rich and active Q&A um, after this. We've got lots of lots to think about with regard to translation, um, connections between, among, within, across languages and cultures. Um, and let me let me just briefly now introduce um, Han Bo. Um, is born um, in Gongwei, um, in, in, in uh, Heilongjiang. Heilong um, Right, and um, writes a good deal in at least uh, some of his work about China and Russia and where they meet and overlap in that part of the world. Um, we'll hear a little bit about that tonight. Uh, but as with, with uh, Eugene, um, Han Bo does a lot. Um, not just a poet, but uh, also uh, a visual artist, painter whose work has recently been on display um, here in Shanghai at the uh, Contemporary Art Museum uh, on People Square. Uh, he's a novelist. His first novel recently came out in, in Chinese. A playwright, a travel writer, writer, and a curator. Graduate of Pudong University. Um, he has been, as I noted, the University of Iowa International Writing Fellow. Uh, he's spent time as well in Germany, uh, Bosch Foundation and Berlin Literature Association grant recipient, uh, where he studied uh, contemporary painting. Um, he has also received the Henry Luce Foundation Vermont Studio Poet and Artist in Residence Award and spent time there working. I believe that's where you worked with Catherine Platt in Vermont. Yeah, okay. Um, and has been the guest of numerous festivals um, and exhibition sites across China and uh, throughout the world, including Moscow, Hong Kong, Shanghai, of course. Uh, recent poetry collections include uh, Temple of Arrivals and Departures. That's the English title given to it by Captain Platt, um, the Chinese Fei Chu Lai Si, his uh, other poetry collection, Jason uh, Xin, Borrowing the Depths of the Heart. Uh, he is also the author of a nine poem cycle, Zhong Dong Tian, the China Eastern Railway, which uh, I've translated, and Catherine Platt has worked on translations of. A series of poems written in the United States at Iowa uh, called Western Days, which we'll hear from tonight as well, which Eugene knows about um, having been the judge who read uh, read those translations for the 2019 Acid Coat Close Approximation Translation Contest. And he wrote a lovely citation that I'll quote a little bit about, uh, a little bit from uh, before we hear from Humble. Um, his novel, this is most recently published work, uh, the English title, Three Bedrooms, One Living Room, and One Dining Room, uh, San Shi Liang Ting, just recently out. I think you have copies here. Do you have yeah, copies? Yeah, okay, I, yes. I, I, if anybody's interested later um, for sale, we have copies, and there are also copies of the um, chapbook, uh, which includes translations of Hanbo's poetry that we'll hear from uh, here tonight. Uh, he's also a dramatist, I should add, and founded Shanghai's um, Ewood Drama Studio and has produced over 10 plays. So, a busy man, and um, very happy to welcome Humble back to NYU Shanghai. He was here about four or five years ago uh, to inaugurate our, hopefully, can we say post COVID? Not really, but um, right, the return of in person. Literary readings here at Shanghai, uh, NYU Shanghai. Uh, so, humble, uh, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be reading Catherine Platt's translations uh, from this uh, collection, Western Days. Thank you, David. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, one reason is after getting wired, I never visit a university. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also enjoyed Eugene's draft uh, of reggae. It impressed me so much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, two. One person's 
好过天空带子银行。少壮青年月，迟暮夕光辉。一只野兔，替代无数只，咀嚼抚养有别的尘土。账目不清，硬梗梗。做浑罗一物的浮云。The hare. One gathers the grass. One gathers up the sky. Grass and sky both on extended loan. The old begrudge the radiance of youth. A single hare representing the multitudes, nodding and pondering various platitudes, accounts indecipherable. A stiff stem stuck like turmoil in a cloudless sky.连城民族细分一批瘦马撞见另一批他马即地狱他妈的彭坦斯坦并入正确坛婚处取鬼神愿愤上人因乌舍睁眼睡觉邻里三更运动后护至长短是非颜色月入千窗体千分和风搭在
feels that no one has clear harvested and greater good. A small piece of cultivated wasteland, farmland abandoned on a Sunday afternoon, a meticulous chessboard of fields on this nominally correct but going nowhere American continent, anonymous before Columbus, namely. Prairie fires do not consume wild grass, spring winds blow, and it lives again. A handful of wildly ambitious families felled, by, felled the young trees, set the emptiness upright. Even more wildly ambitious plants crackled as they burned, but stayed green within, abandoning the fruits of autumn, ignoring passing travelers, flaying, biting, wrangling, ignoring the wood gear fungus, all listening at once, ignoring the minor nagging of mushrooms. Beneath the oak tree, someone is searching for desire under the elms, retrieving the small purple alfalfa flowers that you and I retrieve from each other. We are scattered like stars on a muddy Sunday afternoon, pleading with the pine needle and thorn bushes we cherish. A small place, abandoned but eventful, intentional and arbitrary, an iron fence delineating unintended limits. A small abandoned place imploring Columbus to undo Sunday and all that implies a farm that is wasteland, browsing a farm, dozing as village children run hand in hand to tip over a cow. It is from another series of points about the Chinese Eastern Railway, which was built by Russians but occupied by Japanese. And after 1949, it was, of course, it's China, <laughs> China. And uh, I, I was born there, many of you mentioned. Now, Xing Qi, Zhang Dai, sometimes he lives in the forest. Now, he lives in the forest. 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 He lives in the 黑烟甩向俄国,进步的能死之物无从拆起. Modernity or the contemporary. Sometimes she lives in the temporary. Modernity means Greenwich Mean Time locked in its tracks, anxiety, tea nipping at tough walls. Sometimes she demolishes fabricated modernity, lives in the self-immolation of the thought of the contemporary, black smoke pouring toward Russia. Progress awaiting dead things beyond demolition. Yeah,你可投机。车窗默念穿。平原的穿机。野鸭下蛋的机子。可投机与王进喜。默念时不我语。中途保温的如画的热的闷墙穿机。火车捉滚。火车捉滚。车窗将来穿机。将来会拔时代的车窗，愤怒解决方案。季节旋律的野鸭只为湍急的平静下蛋，石油的平静成为歇。车过大气，鬼装新的乘客悻悻以鸭，无心的逃票者彼此乱投彼此，时不我语。We
frozen earth sealed off by insulated walls, heated picturesque rapid flow. The train picks up speed, the train picks up ghosts, train windows, the future's rapid flow, the future window on the era of scarcity, wrath settling on its plans. Wild duck breeding season yields eggs laid amidst rapid flows, tranquility, the tranquility of oil never ending. Passing through Gachi, ghosts pass through passengers' hearts, grateful for wild ducks. Accidental fair dodgers ride black, falling into one another with me at a remove. Okay, um, I'm gonna read the Russian translation of this, but if you could be who just text me to say hello. <laughs> um, uh, it's called Дикие утки и ветряные вышки, окна вагонные, безмолвных мыслей стремительный лед, низины болот стремительный лед, диким уткам время садится на яйца, нефтяным вышкам и ударнику вансы безмолвными мыслями за временем не угнаться, снимает печаль застывшей красы смерзлой земли вокруг стремительный лед. Теплой воздушной волны, пояс несется, рельсы его несут, черти его несут, окна вагонные, грядущего стремительный лед, грядущее к этому времени не достает окон вагонных, хоть так разобраться с гневом, дикие утки, прирученные временем года, садятся на яйца, усмиряя стремительный лед, безмолвное смирение нефти. Во веки не перестает, пояс минует до цин, людей в вагоне аж разбирают черти, дикие утки, какой восторг, эти невольные безбилетики прянут, норовят друг на друга, но за временем к ним не угнаться. Hey 像夜空挂晒眼神一样失眠连敏挂晒巡视下的表层车厢里的进口意志梦见草的主人下马定居水泥潮闷的汗牛羊的下很光骨受的水灾黑烟为天下变只身打马打马的铁轨的使者假托高
主义的速度走向，卸下大头，运走旧社会与不同。郊野间天气失眠，铁轨抽送的复印机被游客。浅睡的偶尔，已被塑料袋里游泳的人推搡几下。饮食进程四笔废纸了，暗箱成凶器，愿命各悬殊。废纸失眠，复印大同的失眠，无法复印无为或同志。塑料袋里上岸的佛陀，脱下自己泳装的内裤，松紧带儿深耕赘肉的勒，旧村镇唯一存储过往。New district. The weather report persuades the weather to obey reality's ideology. The red deer obeys the maze of deer trails. Thunder showers hurl plastic bags to earth behind the transfer station. The new district, resembling half a box of leftovers, hissing exhalations add vinegar and oil. The ideology of rapid growth. Do away with Godwin. The great unity. Ship off the old society and assemble the new and different. Suburban fields, insomnia weather, railways pump it out like photocopiers, leaving little space in which to live. Light sleep, always sometimes already occupied by plastic bags, swimming with people, shoving, pushing back, seizing ground. The hermit heads into the city, compares himself to a waste bin, a camera obscura. A capturing the unfortunate, each and every fate suspended within. Waste paper, insomnia, copy dot com. Insomnia is to be unable to copy Wu Wei or perhaps even the Tongzhi Emperor. Washed ashore in plastic plastic bag, Buddha sheds his swimsuit. Really, it's just underwear. The elastic band fitting deep into his fat, compressing its mark. The old villages, the soul ground, memories come and gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, at this point, um, Mana, we'll, we'll shift into talk show mode. Um, and uh, and I, we invite questions, comments from the audience, um, and also from those joining us remotely. If you if you put your uh, questions, if you have comments or questions, you put those in the chat. Um, we will get them and we'll ask them on your behalf, or we'll, we'll, we'll hear you. We can hear you too if you uh, raise your hand out there in Zoom land, and uh, we can put you on the screen. We're all in this together. It's it's marvelous. Okay. Um, so, grab a chair. Um, any questions? I've got plenty of my own, but um, better to hear some from any of you. Yeah, um, right up front. Uh, I guess. Can you talk a little bit about what the process of like translating poetry is like? And how do you like mimic sounds of one language and another or not like things can Um I mean what it's like for me. Um very often you can't really mimic the sounds of another language, you have to reconstruct it. And it's the same with the meaning. You don't um uh you basically have to try to think of, because the issue is that you're not just translating from language to language very often, at least in the kind of translation that I usually do. I very often work with um, uh, kind of early 20th century things, which are uh, Russian, which are written in a kind of classical poetics that the way that I do it in English, I have to kind of reinvent from zero. So it's not like I do rhyme for rhyme, um, but approximations. As far as what the process is like, um, I mean, it's pretty relaxing. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, um, um, I mean, it's like, it's, there's a way in which it's different from other writing because like you get into the groove, but the groove in a sense is already there and you just need to catch it, right? Um, 
uh, which is a little different from working in vacuum because you also have to make the um, I What I'm doing now, for example, is uh, it's a project that I didn't really, I mean, I kind of stumbled into because a friend of mine started doing this. Um, a friend of mine in Russia uh, was sitting in COVID quarantine with um, uh, Ovid's letters from exile, the Roman poet who was exiled by Augustus with his poems from exile, which are extremely significant texts in Russian. So she did not so much, I mean, translations of like the Poundian sort, where you just kind of write the poem drawing coming from this text and trying to catch the trying to catch the intonation of the text, but not necessarily repeat them. So she's doing that with uh, the Russian translation of a Latin text. And I thought, okay, now I can come in and I can really do like variants uh, in English where, where it's sometimes literal, sometimes just breaks away, sometimes it talks back. Um, and I think it's very, you know, we have this weird uh, idea of authorship, which comes from publishing and translation, where there's like the author and then there's the translator. But for me, I mean, that model is important, but there are lots of other models. There are also a model where uh, the readers are expected to be bilingual and they're expected to appreciate the way that you talk back to the text because translation also involves talking back to the text. And I like the talking back part. I mean, it's not what I always do. I'm usually irresponsible, but sometimes I let myself be irresponsible. And then uh, Melanie and back good questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you both for your readings. I really enjoyed it, and I loved um, such a different experience to hear the poems. And so, actually, my question: um, Did you? I saw that you put a lot of words in red to highlight, and I was wondering if you could talk about the visual aspects of your poetry. And do you publish it that way, or was that something that you tried to have stand out for us? And maybe in your process, how I guess. Are you, do you consider yourself more visual? I was really fascinated by that, so. I, I mean, do I consider myself more visual? Um, I do, I mean, I pun a lot, right? And punning in lots of ways is visual. Um, and um, another big translation project that I finished recently is a translation of futurist visual poetry. But normally I don't think of myself as a visual poet. I mean, um, um, why do I, I what, okay, so especially with the sonnets, I like doing it line by line in PowerPoint uh, because it creates a certain kind of rhythm, which is the way that I want it read. Um, and as far as the red color is concerned, uh, I like the effect. Uh, and sometimes I use it to emphasize puns. Uh, and sometimes I just use it decoratively. Uh, and it's not meant to be published that way. It's just, I started doing PowerPoints like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, a question right here. Um, hi, thank you so much for reading. Um, you mentioned that you're working as a composer. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I realize there are a lot of musical elements in the poem. So I guess I'm curious about the creative process, how they inspire each other. Well, thank you. Um, the I mean, I've worked with a couple of composers, but the composer I work with mainly is Lucia Ronchetti, who is an Italian composer. And 
she is a very old friend of mine, but now she's super successful. Uh, super successful. I mean, now she's in charge of uh, Venice, the music finale in Venice. Um, uh, and she also understands that I'm really bad with music. So uh, she doesn't send me music for me to put words to. Um, but basically, the three or four pieces that I did for her, she just gave me very concrete directions. Uh, the idea was hers, and I tried to kind of put it into words. Uh, but the pirate, actually, she wanted to do something based on my book. And together, we worked on a libretto uh, where I picked the poems, and she cut them. Then I rewrote them. Then she cut them again. But, but the music always comes second. I mean, we work on the text first, which is not a very normal way of doing it. But it's easier that way for me. If we could pick up on the first question about translation and also bring that. One of the biggest challenges in translating poetry is, is translating um, inventive language, wordplay, um, puns, um, neologisms, right? And, and uh, I, you work a lot in that field and you've been translated in um, uh, humble. You also do a lot with. I think the title of the first poem in Zhongdong um, Kiedu, mm -hmm. the Shindai um, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's got about three or four dimensions of meaning in Chinese, yeah. at least, right? Um, modernity, the contemporary, um, the idea of the chi of the tool, and then of sexual organs, yeah. um, which is, I can tell you, uh, having struggled with that and talked to other people, it's really hard to translate in any way that begins to sort of address that range of meanings. <coughs> um, I, I went with modernity, modernity organ at one point, it was modernity tool, right? And um, round and round I went, and I know other translators who've been working on this poem as part of Hugh Lee's project have been struggling with that too. Uh, so I guess my question is um, for both of you, um, maybe how important is that kind of thing that poetry does so well, which is that concentrated meaning achieved by wordplay, inventiveness to the poem when you write it? Um, and how important does that become in translation? And especially for, for you, perhaps being as a translator, but also you've been translated from Russian into uh, German into to English. How much depends on a translator pulling off something that approximates the inventiveness that you achieved in your in your native language with with something like Shendai Shinchi, that that very concentrated phrase? Uh, I think I can't control the translator. <laughs> Chinese is so particular. Yeah, you you know Shendai Shinchi. Mm. I think uh, for me. It almost couldn't be translated exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, in German, in, in Russian, in, in Spanish, it's quite different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every version is quite different. Yeah, um, I, I think maybe it, it's part of uh, poetry mm -hmm. couldn't be translated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other part is something the translators could uh, reinvent it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that idea of reinvention and that you can't control the translator and there's an element of um, creative writing that goes beyond what people often think of as the translation as being a kind of one-to-one -one yeah, yeah. transmission. The translator may be uh, another author. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, same here. I, I mean, uh, if the translator can't reproduce that exact word game, and usually it's not possible. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I would rather have a different word game mm -hmm. than no word game at all. Mm. Uh, back to the audience, uh, questions, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so again, thank you so much for the readings and actually I have two questions, one for each. And I guess 
maybe for starting uh, maybe some ambiguity. So maybe actually adding on to uh, translation questions that I pitched earlier. So I guess when it comes to, as you mentioned before, when it comes to translating, it's really hard sometimes to directly, directly translate you know, mm -hmm. between different languages. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, like, maybe sometimes it's maybe necessary for the translator to, for some reinvent the words mentioned. So I wonder, like, has it ever come to a time when, when you come to worry about, like, you're overtaking the poems and you're actually putting something that belongs more to you in the origin of poems? Have you ever had this sort of concern? I mean, now with the Ovid project, I'm kind of worried about that. Um, uh, I mean, because the variance is just huge. I mean, in some ways, we're having a conversation, uh, but there's the problem is that I'm always having the last word. Um, and maybe the way to deal with that would be for me to write a few of it and have her translate it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really an issue. It's an issue. I mean, even with a normal translation, it's an issue. I mean, and the fact is that with a, with a translation into English, it's a much bigger issue than translation into other languages for the kind of the political reason that when you translate it to English, you depending on you know who the publisher is, but in general, uh, you're translating for a whole bunch of different audiences. Uh, in lots of cases, global audiences. Uh, and in lots of cases, I mean, in some cases, like, I don't know, I mean, I've done contemporary, project, contemporary projects where I'm translating it to English and then I send it to people I know who are like in organizations with grants, right? If I'm translating it to like Russian, that's, that's not something that can happen. Right. So English has a particular kind of practical power, uh, uh, which one also needs to be yeah, And then for my other question for Han Bo, so I'm um, so actually before this, I'm not so familiar with the works, but just from the one you've read before, I noticed that there's a strong sense of like maybe reminiscent of the past. It's always about like maybe from the previous century about how that time of China would be. So I actually wonder like, do you write about the present as well? Or I guess maybe what is your concept of past and present? No, it's present. Oh, it's present. <laughs> oh, it's about present. Yeah. Yeah. But in that case, like, do you, how, how would you visualize that? Um, I guess, how do you, con how do you like conceptualize that? Your poems? No, sorry? Like, how, how would you conceptualize maybe like the intertwining the past and present? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, our past is also our past. Uh, the present, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, actually, I think we all live in a kind of history, yeah, even now, yeah. And uh, you know, in China, it's quite uh, complex, uh, around one hundred, maybe two hundred years, yeah. So lots of concept from history uh, still control us, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe they conflict each other. Thank you. Right here. Um, actually, I have a question for Han Wu too. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, could I, I want to remind everyone, we have some people on Zoom, and I, I know they can hear us if we speak up, so just, uh, we'll, we'll speak as loud as we can. Uh, I have some uh, question for Han Wu, because I noticed that the words, you, like your common editions, is quite unique. For example, the Hei Yan Gua Shai, because I noticed that uh, Gua and Shai, they are two words, actually, it's not uh, words, so you use different characters mm -hmm. to build new words. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite interesting. I, I was wondering, how did you come up with these ideas? Uh, yeah. I think it's a quite big issue <laughs> about <laughs> the Chinese language. You know, Chinese language uh, changed uh, several times. Every time, there's a great change. Uh, uh, for example, I think Hua Shai, maybe in traditional Chinese, it's no, it's no problem. But, but even to us, to now, maybe we think it's a, a kind of problem. It's some some words new, uh, but you know, in, in traditional Chinese, every uh, words or even characters are uh, very free. Yeah, they can they can uh, 
confirm post to and uh, they can reinvent something new. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, but after maybe after uh, 1949, mm. I think that uh, it's third time a uh, great change of Chinese contemporary language and our language became too simple. Yeah. So I, I think maybe it's, it's not a very good thing for the writers. Mm. Yeah. It also, of course, it's good for communication, mm. but not so good for writers. Mm. So I want to borrow something from the traditional mm. Chinese language. I think it's our, uh, of course, it's very important heritage mm -hmm. to us. Thank you. There was another question right here. Yes. Um, uh, I have a question for Eugene. So it's maybe a very stupid question, but I uh, just wonder what does Spinoza mean to you? I mean, because it's kind of, you, you have lots of references to this, this metaphysics. I mean, metaphysics uh -huh. today, no one believes in metaphysics. It's just all the um, <laughs> <laughs> So for me, um, I started working on the Spinoza book. I mean, it's, it's a long time ago, right? And I started working on it when I was reading a lot about philosophy of now. Um, and in fact, I was working in Turkey, it was 20 years ago, and I took, uh, uh, I took a long train ride. Uh, and I took a copy of Spinoza's Ethics. And um, so, I mean, those of you that don't know, so Spinoza is a 17th century uh, Jewish Dutch philosopher, a rationalist, who uh, tried to build a metaphysical system in the form of Euclidean geometry. So you start off with definitions of common notions and then you build theorems. So he tries to do like a geometry, but it's a geometry with, with God and with emotions and with reason and so on and so forth. Um, so for me, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, it's an admirable project, right? I mean, in a way it's kind of this, the, the summit of kind of the European philosophy's obsession with geometry. But on the other hand, the way it looks, if you're taking a train in Turkey, I mean, the way it looks today, right, uh, is, uh, well, first of all, at the time of Spinoza, there was only one geometry. This means that the axioms were not, they were truths about the world. They were not truths, they were not like postulates. They were, they were actually real things about the world, right? Uh, in the 19th century, when other geometries emerged, they stopped being absolute truths, he asked. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one thing that's interesting about reading Spinoza. Another thing, is that the very idea of doing a geometry in natural language, where the terms are really, I mean, you know, one of the things about math is that the terms are so fixed, right? They have very, very, very precise meaning, right? With Spinoza, I mean, he tries to give up precise meanings, but you can't, you can't do it with natural language. Then things, in the very beginning, what he thinks of as something that is self-evident, it's just, it's self-evident if you're Spinoza, but it's not self-evident, you know, if you're not. And, you know, finally, uh, you know, after Gödel, just the ability of any axiomatic system to come up with truths about the world that are not public. Anyway, so it's just this incredibly threat, beautiful, but totally threatened project. So 
it allows you to think about, you know, just about rationality and about um, uh, different kinds of language. Math is a language in which, which you can do things with, but you can't say anything. Um, or human languages and the way that they work differently. So I don't know how much of this came out in the book, um, uh, but that's what I was thinking about when I was working. I mean, it, uh, it sounds to me when you when you read it, it sounds like I mean, just like the train, you know, moving blindly, each bumping another mm -hmm. forward. It sounds like a kind of a physical dirge or lost in a metaphysical language. So kind of, yeah, that's kind of what it is. Thank you. And and for um, Ambo, I have another oh, question. Oh, we have a question back Go ahead, right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, so I, I just wonder what does like, Russian literature mean for you? Yes. Uh, for me. Yeah, I mean, for you and for like, the Chinese language. Modern Chinese language, to some extent, was you know modernized mm -hmm. by Russian literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it? Yeah, Russian literature is great, of course. As even now, uh, actually yesterday, we, I also talked with, with my friend about the, the the importance of Russian literature to, to Chinese writers, yeah, and I also visited uh, Russia several times. Actually, I, I think uh, uh, the character of some Russian writers, poets, for, for example, Ahmad Bo, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's so strong. It's, uh, and I think the such kind of writer, the character of such kind of writer, maybe even uh, more strong than every Chinese writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you know the social pressure at that moment in the Soviet Union. And, but uh, there, there were still so many great writers in Russia. Yeah, I think maybe we also need some uh, such kind of energy of, of, of power of personality. Yeah. Yeah. Question way in the back. Yeah. Um, I'm. I was. I'm just curious when. Um, when you guys talked about translation, me as a Spanish speaking uh, young reader, I try to always read li uh, whatever I'm going to read in the original language. Um, because I know some things might get lost in translation. Um, and I'm just curious when, when you're translating to another language, do you try to compensate for those lost um, concepts or, say, or ideas? I don't know if my question is getting across. Um, for example, in Spanish, some words may have we have multiple meanings to some words without mentioning the full meanings. Um, and when that is translated to English, for example, um, some of those things are lost, but we find some other ones. So I just want to know if uh, when you're doing the translation, you try to compensate that, or do you have that in mind? Yeah, I think the key word here is try. You can't always do it. Um, uh, and sometimes you do it, you really have to go out on a limb and you're not sure that this is an adequate compensation. You know, it's not arithmetic. You know, you can't say I have 12 here, so I have 12 here. Um, but yeah, you try, yes, absolutely. Um, I love that the uh, asymptote, asymptote, if you're interested in translation into English from multiple languages, it's a wonderful online journal that publishes mm -hmm. a lot of great writing uh, from uh, languages other than English in English translation, and including the Catherine Flat translation, mm -hmm. the Hamburg poems, which Eugene judged for the close approximation contest. And I think that says it really nicely. It, the idea of the close approximation is about as good as you get and hope for. But asymptote also, there are other aspects of translation, which is what asymptote does mm -hmm. in Words Without Borders. And this is, it's kind of the social aspect. 
uh, asymptote which turned 10 in mm -hmm. the last week uh, has been incredible in building an international community. The editor in chief is in Singapore. Uh, and but they basically have um, you know editors everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, including Berlin. Um, so it's really so there's this building up of an international community, which is not an American creative writing mm -hmm. centered on you know this college, that mm -hmm. college, right? And it's not even necessarily American at all, right? Um, uh, but but nonetheless, um, uh, extremely powerful and extremely extremely interesting. So there's there's a way in projects like Asymptote, there are other similar projects where they've really managed to go beyond borders and to internationalize. Uh, the conversation among, you know, and to have it among people who would not normally be having it. You, you, you've written and spoken about translation when, it, when it's done in a certain way. Um, I believe you said, you know, you've talked about it with regard to the idea of um, decolonization of American, yeah. of, of, of the sort of American centered and American cited literary world. Um, and, and your feeling is that that's very important to be able to. Yeah, I think it's yeah, very important. Yeah. It's very, it's really important again because English is so powerful, because it's the global language, mm -hmm. uh, because there's tremendous inequality between students mm -hmm. and English. Uh, uh, so, for example, with the Russian contemporary stuff that, you know, we've been able to to make use of this with F letter. Um, I mean, we now in the States have almost like a mini empire on the East Coast where we built a network uh, of, tra of translators of people who work on contemporary Russian literature uh, with small conferences. For instance, and in such a way that now, basically, when we bring in authors to the East Coast, um, we can have, I think, more than half dozen mm -hmm. venues, basically, between Harvard down to Philadelphia, like in this corridor. Uh, and that's also a really, really important aspect of translation, it's not just working on text, it's also working with people, um, uh, publishing, uh, finding small presses. So it's a, it's a uh, there's a lot of, I don't know, admitted whether administrative is the right word. You, you can find Nambo's <laughs> poems in the translation of Catherine Platt on, and also recordings and, and before as a, I'm about reading them on Asymptote, a wonderful resource. We have time for one more question, I think. Uh, well, we have a couple more. Okay, right here and then back to the back. Um, I have a question for all of you. Um, have you ever encountered a poem that you were unable to translate, or have you ever written a poem that you didn't want to be translated? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever written a poem that you felt like good? Shouldn't be translated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe I have some. I have some words couldn't be translated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of, of course it, it should be translated. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but I think it's very uh, very difficult because uh, some piece of my works I borrowed some traditional Chinese words from very traditional. Yeah, I think it, even for Chinese, it's very difficult to understand. <laughs> yeah. But of course, the translators could reinvent something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when you read authors uh, writing in languages other than Chinese, translated into Chinese, do you ever encounter a translation and you think that 
completion have done that. <laughs> that that wasn't a good translation. <laughs> or uh, especially if you have translations you can compare side by side. What's the state of literary translation into Chinese? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, of course. For, for example, if some uh, some poem translated from Polish mm. into Chinese, you uh, know some some Polish uh, same piece of poem uh, in Polish. Uh, now we have different versions of translate translation. It's quite different. It's just, just like a different piece of works uh, from this different points. Yeah, uh, in in such kind of situation, I couldn't judge. But we which one is yeah it is better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I always find poems that I can't translate. I mean, because. And I think I think for everybody that's the case. I mean, if you want to do a good job, it has to be something that speaks to you in a particular way, in kind of a wavelength that you can catch. Sometimes you like poems, but you can't catch the, that mm. particular wavelength in 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 your language. Um, and uh, as far as my own work, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I have. Lots of pieces, for example, in the pirate who does know the value of pi, which got translated to German, that you know, are not in the German translation. Some of them because they're based on a pun that's simply not possible in German, and you can't. I mean, uh, and you can't uh, uh, you can't compensate it because it's too important. I know German. Do you have any examples? Well, I mean, there's there's a there's a piece about. Um, uh, uh, there's a piece about hand washing where the key pun is germs and Germany, right? So it doesn't work in German. It works in Italian really well, right? <laughs> so it's available in Italian, but it's not available. So we have one more back here, um, and I want to share a quote by a Chinese translator called Chen and he said that. Goes to other translators who are more competent. Uh, and I have a question for Ms. Campbell. Um, turning to him to Frank, uh, as he said, uh, my question is um, how do you think being from Bloomberg shaped the way you write about it? What's the way you don't bear it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe uh, I liked Dumbay quite a long time. I think I read it around 30 years. Just a part of my memory. It's about, actually, it's about the 1980s. Not, not now. You know, in the 1980s, quite different from now. Uh, there's still lots of very big factories. Yeah, and uh, the workers have very good income at, at that moment. But for now, you know, <laughs> everything changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I'm very interested in, in, the, in this area. You know, before uh, 1949, this area is uh, named the Manjo. Yeah, actually, it, it, it's a name about uh, the, the nationality yeah, of Manjo. Yeah. Not, not only the, a name of the country, yeah, you know. Um, you know, in, in such kind of area, uh, actually, it, it has very little connection with the uh, uh, Hanzu, yeah, before. And, uh, you know, uh, I think Manchu problem is not a problem of only about China, it's a, it's a problem mm -hmm. about the international politics. Mm -hmm. You know the, the real way. The Chinese uh, is a real way. I, I think it uh, it should be a result of the, the conflict between Russia and uh, the Great Britain. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the, the Russian Empire, uh, they think they, they must occupy this area as, as as fast as could, and uh, it's so complex. <laughs> Well, yeah, and um, I think that we, we do have some copies of the um, 
bilingual edition of Chinese and English translation of Renjie's Better Than Ever, if you're interested. Um, you can sell them cheap. Um, and, uh, and then Eugene had some copies of the of the duckling uh, mini, mini broadside. Maybe you can talk to him. Uh, and I think that'll be it for tonight. But uh, thank you so much um, for making this first. Uh, wanted to say post COVID, and that's not quite true, but our uh, return so successful. Uh, and thank you to those of you who might still be out there in, in Zoom land. Um, and thank you very much to Eugene and uh, Hanbo for coming. And also uh, to Renji for helping set everything up over here. Thank you so much. Thank you.